Well, good afternoon to everyone. We're going to get started uh, with this session on climate challenges and health, health tech solutions. Miami on the front lines. And I want to start by, first of all, uh, acknowledging the fact that this is the 10th year of eMERGE and congratulating Manny and Melissa Medina for the amazing job they have done in creating the most important tech conference in the Americas. We at the University of Miami have been privileged to be partners from the beginning. Yes. My, my name is Julio Frank. I have the honor of being the president of the University of Miami. And uh, I want to uh, thank uh, yet again uh, eMERGE for inviting us to have one, uh, a session on such a timely topic. Uh, I want to start, however, by issuing uh, an apology. I do not like all men panels. Uh, having a twin sister, I'm not used to this. But I have to say that we did invite two very talented researchers from the university. And unfortunately, they were engaged in other sessions. However, uh, the entire team that put this session together is a team of incredibly talented women at our university. And we have a great, uh, a great team of scientists and making an effort both in science and engineering to increase the proportion of women in, in those fields. Notwithstanding that, we do have a stellar panel. Uh, and I'm just going to mention their, their position so that we can get started. Um, f first, uh, just going in order, uh, the order they're sitting, David Rue, who is the Global Chief Medical Officer at Microsoft. Dr. Steven Neimer, who is uh, the, the director of the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center, in addition to being the executive dean for research at the Miller School of Medicine and Dr. Pratim Biswas, who is the Dean of the College of Engineering at the uh, University of Miami. Let me uh, clearly, and we know this, Miami is ground zero for the effects of climate change. But today, we're going to focus on of all the multiplicity of effects that climate change has. How does it impact human health, specifically? And then what role can technology play in addressing some of those challenges. And just to frame the conversation, I want to highlight that there are six major mechanisms or forms in which climate change affects health. The first, of course, is by causing extreme weather events like hurricanes and extreme drought and, and, uh, and all kinds of storms. And it's both the extreme weather events that usually cause loss of life or an injury and the ensuing outbreaks of diseases that happen when basic public services and power uh, is, is challenged or interrupted. Second mechanism is, of course, around rising sea levels, which is a very major threat here in Miami, including the contamination of aquifers and therefore threatening the supply of drinking water, which is essential for life and health. The third mechanism is the changing ecology of vector-borne diseases because now mosquitoes and other vectors are present at latitudes where they were not present before, they were too cold for them, but they are now being present in a, in, on a broader set of latitudes. And that's how we're seeing resurgence of malaria, uh, emergence of new uh, vector-borne diseases like Zika, uh, just a higher prevalence of vector-borne diseases. Fourth, very important, is the direct health impact of heat. As the planet he heats up, heat itself represents a threat to, to human health, to human homeostasis, especially in elderly populations and people who don't have access to cooling or air conditioning. Uh, the fifth is the implications of climate change on food insecurity, leading to undernutrition and all the health impacts. And fa finally, one that we don't talk very often about is the way climate change, through all the previous mechanisms, can interrupt the delivery of care, both for acute and chronic conditions. So with that frame of the consequences, I'm, I want to start with Dr. Steven Neimer. Because Miami, as ground zero for all of these consequences, I, I want to ask you, Steve, how do you see things from the health system perspective, both uh, uh, you know, being an academic medical center, the only academic health system in South Florida, UHealth, 
where you oversee research for the entire system. And then as, a, as the head of a, one of our premier centers, taking care of a particularly vulnerable population, which are cancer patients. Well, thank you. So I think so many of us have uh, come to South Florida from somewhere else. And what you immediately go through is an annual hurricane preparedness ritual. So in terms of on the research side, but in particular on the hospital side, uh, we prepare uh, and held drills so that we can deal with emergencies that come up. Um, I, I would say one of the greatest challenges we faced across the world, but certainly here, was also related to the COVID pandemic. And what was remarkable in South Florida is how we work together across different health systems uh, to manage our beds, to manage PPE, to work with the state, to help with vaccine distribution. And I think that that was a valuable lesson for us about how to work together because prior to COVID, I think health systems worked uh, one-off, very disparate. So uh, we've been working together uh, and trying to figure it out together because uh, there's both the preparing for what you say, um, the warming of the environment. So for instance, in the cancer center, we are looking at the density of trees and we're looking at sun exposure because we can predict a lot of sun can uh, skin cancer is gonna come about with warming, uh, the tree cover is important, uh, sunscreen use. So we're already introducing things now that can help prevent cancer. Second, uh, I mentioned is in the emergency situation. So during COVID, for instance, cancer patients didn't wanna travel. So we actually, if you were on a clinical trial and you were getting an experimental medicine, we went out to the patient and we got approval from the drug companies, from the IRB, to deliver the care to the home instead of having people come. Uh, we have 10 different sites across South Florida where we deliver care, so if there was a hurricane, probably uh, two-thirds of them would be able to continue to deliver care, and so through the electronic medical record and other things to deliver care. So there are a number of technologies. Uh, the other thing I would just mention uh, we have these game changer vehicles that also deliver care in the community and they can be expanded if there are events that are very disruptive. Thank you very much, um, uh, Steve. And uh, let me now t turn um, to uh, David Rue as the head of the Chief Medical Officer of Global for, for Microsoft. Um, because the focus today is how can technology help us address all these complex challenges? So I wanted to ask you what is uh, Microsoft planning uh, uh, as you look at the impact of climate change on populations the world over? Yeah, so first of all, thank you for having me. It's been uh, an exciting, uh, but also uh, a, a very important series of events that's happened over the past several years during the pandemic where we've learned a lot about uh, not only what Microsoft and technology can be doing, but also how we can work together with other organizations. Uh, what we found was that no one organization can solve this problem. It's a, a collaboration that has to occur between uh, government agencies, including public health, including uh, hospitals and health systems, and then community-based organizations. Because a lot of this is around mobilizing, uh, getting people uh, to understand more about what they need to do, communications. And as we went through that journey of understanding what those needs were, we saw that during the acute needs, a lot of it has to do around communication. Hmm. We have to communicate, let people know what's going on, where to go. And, and we found that one way to do it was by creating what we will refer to as a, a chatbot. Hmm. Uh, now, the chatbots have now become much better, uh, where it used to be just purely an algorithm that it would just simply allow you to provide information. We could actually upload entire documents and have a person have a conversation with the chatbot, and it could explain things in their language uh, at their grade level with empathy. And so these are the types of technologies now that allow us to be able to provide that direct level of communication. And then as we started getting into some of the other challenges, a lot of it has to do with supply chain, getting information, getting tools and information and supplies to the sites that needed it the most. And we oftentimes find that was something that was disrupted with uh, either the fact that some of it was destroyed and, or some of it had to be rerouted. 
And so understanding how we could leverage technology to identify where to bring things and how to plan for these type of activities. That was something we had to work very closely with a lot of our partners uh, that deliver foods and deliver uh, types of services and medical equipment. And then as we started getting into the actual healthcare delivery itself, we realized that the healthcare delivery is uh, disrupted in many ways. It's very difficult to provide care in the hospital, in the clinics. Sometimes they're destroyed, sometimes there's not enough of them, they're overloaded. So we had to figure out ways to bring care to the communities. And in so doing, we realized that that's when we had to figure out how do we uh, establish, whether it be a, a, a pop-up center where there's uh, vaccinations or screenings or food, uh, but we had to work in collaboration with public health uh, as well as community-based organizations to be able to set these things up. All behind the scenes is the need for data to be captured because when a person is receiving treatment, whether it's in the hospital or clinic or whether it's in some kind of a, uh, an emergency pop-up facility, that information has to be brought back to their medical record. There has to be some record of that information, that delivery of a vaccine or a service to an immunization record. And so all of that back-end technology was something that we also realized needed to be done. And throughout this entire process, we were there along with other partners to be able to figure out technology can help a lot during this acute situation. Now, as we think ahead about how can we then deal with some of the aftermath, we've been recognizing that we can also use technology to be able to identify uh, we'll call risks patients that are at higher risk, uh, zones that are at higher risk, uh, areas that we might be able to intervene if we're seeing things early, early detection of disease. And, and those things may, will allow us to hopefully be able to become more proactive. That's, that's great. Um, it, it, to uh, Dr. Biswas, uh, you know, technology is, is constantly evolving, uh, but we, we are seeing this exponential increase in, in and, and this convergence of technologies and engineering of course is at the at the at the crux of turning fundamental research into actual actionable solutions so Dean this was how how is the college of engineering at the university of miami uh, advancing tech in in this interdisciplinary manner to overcome the challenges that we're talking about in climate and in health great thank you uh, president frank it's a great pleasure to be here and it's Good, you mentioned engineering as a discipline. You know, we train our individual students to be problem solvers. So it's a discipline that is focused on problem solving. A part of that, and you've heard some good examples uh, from my earlier panelists here, that uh, advanced technology has to really step up uh, in coming up with these solutions. And uh, the challenges that we face with uh, climate related issues really puts uh, some pressure for us to really step up and develop more of these technologies. I'll just give a couple of examples. So one is we heard about the pandemic. You know, we, don't, we want to ensure that we don't go through another pandemic in the first place. So how can we do that? So we are designing uh, wearable sensors, when I came in, they put on this microphone so you can hear me, but I would also have a wearable device which tells me that I'm not being exposed to, or if there's a potential for being exposed to an infectious agent, that I take some remedial action. So this technology is stepping up, and it's not just me by myself, it's the entire uh, group here. So there could be a IoT system that is monitoring a crowd, and uh, we can keep everyone safe, right? So that is a good example of a technology where uh, an infectious agent could be spotted and the exposure reduced. In our dormitories on campus, we are also tracking the wastewater, and that's another uh, area where we can get a signature of an infectious agent and then take remedial action. I'll give another example. Uh, due to pressures of adverse situations like a hurricane or maybe a heat incident, we often need, there are vulnerable populations and they need to be taken to a physician. We are all very familiar with the Miami traffic. So can technology play a role? Just the other day we had an autonomous mobility 
uh, summit, an advanced autonomous mobility uh, kind of platform where uh, individuals could be taken to a physician very rapidly. So this would be a very advanced technology. Uh, it could be a combination of surface and air transport and moving people around. So uh, technology has a role to play, even with respect to the climate issues itself. We want to come up and ensure that we don't face adverse situations due to climate change uh, to prevent the adverse effects of climate. So that, these are some of the examples I thought I'll mention. Thank you. You know, th this session is focusing on the, on the intersection between climate change, health, and technology. And one of the intersections that I, I, we, we often don't think about, we, we tend to think of, of, of as, as the examples you've heard have emphasized, on the way technology can enhance health care, among other things, to deal with some of these health consequences of climate change. But it turns out to be that health systems are major contributors to climate change, our own organizations. In the United States, the health system is the largest sector of the economy. And therefore, it is in itself a major source of green, uh, greenhouse gases and other forms of pollution, biological uh, 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 products that need to be disposed of properly, radiological uh, uh, stuff that needs to be disposed of properly. As the largest sector of the economy, it itself has a huge footprint on the environment. So, you know, in a sense, we're here at a situation where we should be leading by example. So let me turn it now not to the diseases and patients, but how do we apply technology to the way we organize and deliver healthcare so that our own carbon footprint and other uh, impacts on the environment are minimized and we can actually say that we lead by example. Dave, do you want to start with uh, yeah, some sure. of your work on that area? Uh, well, first of all, uh, it's a great question. And I was on a call earlier this week with the World Bank, and we were uh -huh. talking about this very topic. And uh, one of the panelists made a very insightful comment, which is it's uh, rather unfortunate that the people who are suffering the most are actually the ones contributing the least to the problem. Uh, the problem is generated not by organizations that, and, and uh, even regions that are suffering, it's, it's by the global community. Sure. And a lot, large part of it has to do with the way that we have been uh, practicing medicine, the way that we have been uh, delivering uh, even technologies. And so there has to be a global commitment to reducing the carbon footprint. At Microsoft, we, we actually recognize that we know technology is a contributor as well, and so we've put together uh, a framework for how we are going to look to see if we can go carbon negative um, by 2030 and then, tw then really extract all the carbon that we've emitted since our inception in 1975 so that we can actually by 2050 uh, remove all of that. I mean, that's an ambitious goal and it'd be great if other organizations at least were to think about you know, the, the, the impact that they're having as well. I think from a healthcare perspective, it's a challenge because uh, during the pandemic, we uh, sort of were encouraging uh, organizations to be using these single-use uh, type of package devices and, and things that we now know today are actually contributing to the waste and, and to the carbon footprint. So it's going to be a challenge for us to kind of unwind that and think about how we can encourage uh, the use of uh, reusables and uh, more washing of things. It, it's, it's something that I, I think we'll, we'll have to gradually get there, but, but hopefully we'll be able to make some progress. Thank you. Thank you. Steve, you know, if we could apply the old dictum, physician, heal thyself, can we say heal, health system, correct yourself so that your own environmental impact is minimized? Well, I, I would say the biggest advance really has been what happens in telehealth, right? And so, um, there are uh, things that the government can do to help us. Um, you know, uh, Sylvester and University of Miami has become a destination uh, for healthcare for parts of the world, and so that increases the carbon footprint. But we also do a lot through telehealth. Um, for a cancer patient, now it's possible to stay at home and get a second and a third opinion without having to travel 
to other cities. And so I think telehealth has been a major advance in reducing things. There are uh, another example just in the research labs and things. In the old days, we used radioactivity for a lot of, to, to monitor and to trace things. Uh, we don't need to do that. Uh, there's an imaging, there's a lot of new imaging technologies that don't contribute to the pollution. So I, I think that there needs to be a lot more to make people aware of what they're doing uh, in the operating room. I think there's still a lot of um, emphasis on reusing surgical tools uh, rather than having disposable. Uh, but I, I, I think um, more, more awareness could be brought to this. Uh. Yeah. I mean, one area I, that I, just looking at, at, at our booth, there's, which I invite everyone to go to the U Health Jackson uh, Health System uh, joint booth here at eMERGE. But I was watching there a, the, the use of artificial intelligence to uh, a, accelerate the development of devices and lead to much more targeted clinical trials to shorten the time to approval, but also to make a less intensive use of resources. One of the things for a research university like ours is, the, is the, I think artificial intelligence is going to in, increase the productivity of the research enterprise itself in a way that could have major impacts in, 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 in making us much more efficient organizations as research organizations. Not so much the patient care, eventually that research finds its way, but, uh, but, but those are all great examples. I, uh, sorry, go ahead. Just, uh, the other thing, the, we have systems with patient reported outcomes. Right. So I think there's, uh, if we can keep people from coming to the emergency room, from being hospitalized, uh, get the care at home, uh, and some of the work we do with patient reported outcomes allows us to intervene very early when people are just beginning to have symptoms. I think uh, Pratim mentioned the ability to, to identify if you've been exposed to something so you can intervene early. And I think that's a way to decrease the footprint as well, if people don't need to come to the hospital to get care. Yeah, absolutely. Pratim. Yes, so this is great. You know, uh, these are global challenge problems we face today, but we have a tremendous opportunity to act locally, as they say to begin to, of course, train our students, train our uh, staff, and so forth in uh, deploying some of these uh, 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 fabulous technologies. And I'll again relate to my colleague here in the health system. Uh, the university is, uh, has a large footprint, and there are many things that we could do. So one, I would say, is uh, just in the, uh, I mentioned the transportation thing, uh, there are many other things. So we need a holistic analysis, right? So oftentimes we say, oh, this is problematic, but you do a holistic, what they refer to as a life cycle analysis to guide our decision making. And again, I'll rely on technology. Let's pick uh, a pacemaker. A few years ago, you would put a pacemaker in, it's battery technology that failed, you know, that had a certain lifetime, I had to again replace it and so forth. So can we design battery systems which are compatible with the human body which will last forever, right? So, and this is happening at the University of Miami. Another example is a knee surgery. Uh, when you go for a knee surgery, you want to really custom design uh, the knee that you're going to put in. I would encourage everyone to go to the UM booth. There is a 3D printer. Uh, we are at the university, we have the ability to you know, take a few x-rays and 3D print a knee that will custom fit you. And obviously this is an alloy which will last forever. So these all have a footprint reduction uh, approach that we take, right, because of all the systems. But many of the other systems using machine learning techniques to ease up the uh, workload. Another example you mentioned uh, I look at asthmatics. This also relates to a justice uh, issue. There are many neighborhoods where there are larger incidences of asthma, and they have to rush to the emergency center. If the physician could monitor these patients and direct them, hey, you're going to get an asthma attack, please move away, or uh, move away from this polluted area, that would be fabulous. So many such good examples, but we are beginning to do that 
working in teams in an interdisciplinary manner to come up with relevant solutions. Thank you. Uh, this is a short session, so I'm going to, to close off, ask each of our panelists uh, a, a, a lightning round of, of, of parting thoughts, you know, about a minute each, just to give us your, your overall parting uh, big message. So David, let's go in the order in which you're seated. Yeah, yeah, so I would say one of the things that we are recognizing is that the, if we think about the hospital, the health system as a contributor to the carbon footprint, if there's ways that we can enable care to be delivered more proactively outside of the hospital, as Dr. Nimer was talking about, that we may be able to not only reduce the carbon footprint, but also deliver better care. And that is something that is very doable today with technology and artificial intelligence as well. We have an ability to screen large populations, identify individuals, and be able to help deliver care in settings that are much more convenient and not have to utilize the, the extensive resources that we have within these scenarios where hospitals are utilizing uh, extraordinary amounts of resources. But in many cases, there are things that are necessary because of the severity. So if we can reduce the severity of illness and get people healthier, we have an opportunity to be able to then address the broader issue from the healthcare perspective. But I think the bottom line is that to, to truly address this, it's gonna require a global commitment by many organizations across many countries to be able to be committed to this effort because uh, this is really the impact that we're seeing after many, many years of uh, doing things a certain way. But uh, by putting a commitment towards that, we have an opportunity to uh, hopefully reduce the trend of what we're seeing. Thank you. Steve? You know, I'd say it's very important uh, to work together to develop resiliency within our health system, and second of all, to focus very much on the most vulnerable populations. The elderly, which are ever-increasing, young people, people who don't traditionally access health care, and of course, people who may have serious health issues, cancer, immunodeficiencies. So those two, now getting them right. Thank you. But but, uh, very briefly, just as in this panel, I think we really need to work in teams. Uh, the corporate sector, my colleagues in the uh, field of medicine, folks in engineering, really working together to come up with translational technologies which are going to make a big difference. A push really is to even look at preventing some of these problems, right, eventually. And that can only happen when uh, I'll pick again the health arena, when a physician can work with a technology developer, can work with the corporate sector to make these happen. So that's the message I would end with. Yeah. Thank you. Well, as we wrap up, I, I just want to say um, this is an existential threat for humankind, not just in Miami, but everywhere in the world. It is a global program, a problem. It needs local solutions. It is a global challenge that we have, simultaneously global and local. And I would just conclude by saying that universities are going to play a key role. Technology led to a lot of these challenges. Technology that greatly improved the quality of life but has had this secondary effect. Technology has to be used to address the same challenges. And universities, as the source of most basic research that then leads to technological improvements, including in healthcare, are there to uh, be documenting the size of the, man the magnitude of the challenge and also developing the solutions to address them. I invite everyone to go to our two booths, U Health, our academic health system at UM, uh, just to get a sampling of the sort of work that a world-class university research, comprehensive research university like the University of Miami is carrying out uh, to uh, deal with this um, challenge of challenges, which is climate change and its impact on, to the most, on the most sensitive of human services, which is healthcare. I thank you all for your presence here, and I hope you will continue to enjoy this fantastic eMERGE conference. Thank you very much.